Chapter Four of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Killer of Monsters. The night wore on, while the creatures above the firelight danced and died, their numbers ever reinforced by fresh arrivals. Burl sat tensely still, his eyes watching everything, while his mind groped for an explanation of what he saw. At last the sky grew dimly gray, then brighter, and after a long time it was day. The flames of the burning hill seemed to dim and die as all the world became bright. After a long while, Burl crawled from his hiding place and stood erect. Not more than two hundred paces from where he stood, a straight wall of smoke rose from the still smoldering fungus range. Burl could see the smoke rising for miles on either hand. He turned to continue on his way and saw the remains of one of the tragedies of the night. A great moth had flown into the flames, been horribly scorched, and floundered out again. Had it been able to fly, it would have returned to its devouring deity, but now it lay upon the ground, its antenna hopelessly seared. One beautiful wing was nothing but gaping holes. The eyes had been dimmed by flame. The exquisitely tapering limbs lay broken and crushed by the violence of landing. The creature was helpless on the ground. Only the stumps of its antenna, moving restlessly and the abdomen pulsating slowly as it drew pain-racked breaths. Burl drew near. He raised his club. When he moved on, there was a velvet cloak cast over his shoulders, gleaming with all the colors of the rainbow. A gorgeous mass of soft blue moth fur was about his middle, and he had bound upon his forehead two yard-long fragments of the moth's magnificent antennae. He strode on slowly, clad as no man had been clad in all the ages before him. After a while, Another victim of the Holocaust, similarly blundered, out to die, yielded him a spear that was longer and sharper and much more deadly than his first. So he took up his journey to Saya, looking like a prince of Ind upon a bridal journey, though surely no mere prince ever wore such raiment. For many miles Burl threaded his way through an extensive forest of thin-stalked toadstools. They towered high over his head, colorful, parasitic molds and rusts all about their bases. Twice he came upon open glades where bubbling pools of green slime festered in corruption. Once he hid himself as a monster scarabaeus beetle lumbered by three yards away, clanking like some mighty machine. Burl saw the heavy armor and inward curving jaws of the monster. He almost envied him his weapons. The time was not yet come, though, when Burl and his kind would hunt such giants for the juicy flesh within its armored limbs. Burl was still a savage, still ignorant, and still essentially timid. His only significant advance had been that where at first he had fled without reasoning, now he paused to see if he need flee. He was a strange sight, moving through the shadowed lanes of the forest in his cloak of velvet. The fierce toothed leg of a fighting beetle rested in a strip of sinew about his waist, ready for use. His new spear was taller than himself. He looked like a conqueror, but he was still a fearful and feeble creature no match for the monstrous creatures about him. He was weak, and in that lay his greatest hope, because if he were strong, he would not need to think. Hundreds of thousands of years before his ancestors had been forced to develop brains as a penalty for the lack of claws or fangs. Burl was sunk as low as any of them, but he had to combat more horrifying enemies, more inexorable dangers, and many times more crafty antagonists. His ancestors had invented knives and spears 
and flying missiles. But the creatures about Burl had weapons a thousand times more deadly than the ones that had defended the first humans. The fact, however, simply put a premium on the one faculty Burl had which the insect world had not. In mid-morning he heard a discordant, deep bass bellow coming from a spot not twenty yards from where he moved. He hid in panic, waiting for an instant, listening. The bellow came again, but this time with a querulous note. Burl heard a crashing and plunging, as of some creature caught in a snare. A mushroom tumbled with a sponge-like sound, and the thud was followed by a tremendous commotion. Something was fighting desperately against something else. Burl did not know what creatures were in combat. He waited, and the noise died gradually away. Presently his breath came more slowly, and his courage returned. He stole from his hiding place and would have made away, but new curiosity held him back. Instead of creeping from the scene, he moved cautiously forward toward the source of the noise. Peering between two cream-colored stalks, he saw a wide, funnel-shaped snare of silk spread out before him, some twenty yards across and as many deep. The individual threads could be plainly seen, but in the mass it seemed a fabric of sheerest, finest texture. Held up by tall mushrooms, it was anchored to the ground below and drew away to a small point through which a hole led to some as yet unseen recess. All the space of the wide snare was hung with threads, fine twisted threads, no more than half the thickness of Burl's finger. This was the trap of a labyrinth spider. Not one of the interlacing strands was strong enough to hold any but the feeblest prey, but the threads were there by thousands. A cricket had become entangled in the sticky maze. Its limbs thrashed out and broke threads with every stroke, but each time became entangled in a dozen more. It struggled mightily, emitting at intervals again its horrible bass roar. Burl breathed more easily. He watched with fascinated eyes. Mere death among insects, even tragic death, held no great interest for him. It was too common an occurrence. And there were few insects which deliberately sought man. Most insects have their allotted prey and will seek no others. But this involved a spider, and spiders had a terrifying impartiality. A spider devouring some luckless insect was but an example of what might happen to Burl. So he watched alertly, his eyes traveling from the enmeshed cricket to the strange opening at the back of the funnel-shaped labyrinth. That opening darkened. Two shining, glistening eyes had been watching from the tunnel in which the spider had been waiting. Now it swung out lightly, revealing itself as a gray spider with twin black ribbons upon its thorax and two stripes of curiously speckled brown and white upon its abdomen. Burl saw also two curious appendages like a tail, as it came nimbly out of its hiding place and approached the trapped creature. The cricket was struggling weakly now, and the cries it uttered were but feeble, because of the cords that fettered its limbs. Burl saw the spider throw itself upon the cricket, which gave one final convulsive shudder as fangs pierced its armor. Shortly after, the spider fed. With bestial enjoyment, it sucked all the succulence, all the fluid, from its victim's carcass. Then the breath left Burl in a peculiar, frightened gasp. It was not from anything he saw or heard. It was something that he thought. For a second his knees knocked together in a self-induced panic. It occurred to him that he, Burl, had killed a hunting spider, a tarantula, upon the red clay cliffs. True, the killing had been an accident and had nearly cost him his own life in the web spider's snare. But he had killed a spider, and of the most deadly kind. Now it occurred to Burl 
that he could kill another. Spiders were the ogres of the human tribes on the forgotten planet. Knowledge of them was hard to come by, because to study them was death. But all men knew that web spiders never left their traps. Never. And Burl had imagined himself making an impossibly splendid, incredibly daring use of that fact. Denying to himself that he intended any action so suicidal, he nevertheless drew back from the front of the snare and made his way to the back, where the spider's tunnel was no more than ten feet away. There he found himself waiting. Presently, through the interstices of the silk, he saw the great bulk of the spider. It had left the drained and shrunken carcass of the cricket to return to its resting place settling itself carefully upon the soft walls of the fabric tunnel. From the yielding, globular nest at the tunnel's end, it fixed maniacal eyes once more upon the threads of its snare, seen down the length of the passageway. Burl's hair stood on end from sheer fright, but he was the slave of an idea. The tunnel and the nest at its end did not rest on the ground but were suspended in air by cables, like those that spread the gin itself. The gray labyrinth spider bulged the fabric. It lay in luxurious comfort, waiting for victims to approach. There was sweat on Burl's face as he raised his spear. The bare idea of attacking a spider was horrifying, but actually he was in no danger whatever before the instant of the spear thrust because web spiders never, never leave their webs to hunt. So Burl sweated and grasped his spear with agonized firmness and thrust it into the bulge that was the spider's body in its nest. He thrust with hysterical fury. And then he ran as if the devil were after him. It was a long time before he dared come back, his heart in his throat. All was still. He had missed the horrid convulsions of the wounded spider. He had not heard the frightful gnashings of its fangs at the piercing weapon, nor seen the silken threads of the tunnel ripped and torn in the spider's death struggle. Burl came back to quietness. There was a great rent in the silken tunnel, and a puddle of ill-smelling stuff lay upon the ground. From time to time, another droplet fell from the spear to join it and the great spider had fallen halfway through its own enlargement of the rent made by the spear in the wall of the nest. Burl stared. Even when he saw it, the thing was not easy to believe. The dead eyes of the spider looked at him with mad, frozen malignity. The fangs were still raised to kill. The hairy legs were still braced, as if to enlarge further the gapping hole through which it had partly fallen. Then Burl felt exaltation. His tribe had been furtive vermin for almost forty generations, fleeing from the mighty insects, hiding from them, and when caught waiting helplessly for death, screaming shrilly in horror. But he, Burl, had turned the tables. He, a man, had killed a spider. His breast expanded. Always his tribesmen went quietly and fearfully, making no sound. But a sudden, surprising, triumphant yell burst from Burl's lips, the first hunting cry of man upon the forgotten planet in two thousand years. Next second, of course, his pulse almost stopped in sheer terror, because he had made such a noise. He listened fearfully. The insect world was oblivious to him. Presently, shuddering but infinitely proud, he drew near his prey. He carefully withdrew his spear, poised to flee if the spider stirred. It did not. It was dead. The blood upon the spear was revolting. Burl wiped it off on a leathery toadstool. Then he thought of Saya and his tribesmen, trembling even as he gloated over his own remarkable self. He shifted the spider and worked it out of the nest. Presently he moved off, with the belly of the spider upon his back, 
and two of its hairy legs over his shoulders. The other limbs of the monster hung limp, trailing on the ground behind him. Marching, then he was the first such spectacle in history, his velvet cloak shining with its iridescent spots, the yard-long scraps of golden antennae bound to his forehead, a spear in his hand, and the hideous bulk of a gray spider for burden. Burl was a very strange sight indeed. He believed that other creatures fled before him because of the thing he carried. He tended to grow haughty. But actually, of course, insects do not know fear. They recognize their own specific enemies. That is necessary. But the history of the lowlands on the forgotten planet went on abstractly, despite the splendid feat of one man. Burl marched. He came upon a valley full of torn and tattered mushrooms. There was not a single yellow top among them. Every one had been infested with maggots that had liquefied the tough meat of the mushroom tops, causing it to drip to the ground below. The liquid was gathered in a golden pool in the center of the small depression. Burl heard a loud and deep-toned humming before he saw the valley. Then he stopped and looked down. He saw the golden pond at surface reflecting the gray sky and the darkened stumps of mushrooms on the hillside which looked as if they had been blackened by a running flame. A small brooklet of golden liquid trickled over a rocky ledge, and all around the edges of the pond and brook, in ranks and rows, by hundreds and by thousands, and it seemed by millions, were the green gold bodies of great flies. They were small compared to other insects. The flesh flies laid their eggs by the hundreds in decaying carcasses. The others chose mushrooms to lay their eggs in, to feed the maggots that would hatch, a relatively great quantity of food was needed. Therefore, the flies must remain comparatively small, or the body of a single grasshopper would furnish food for only a few maggots instead of the hundreds it must support. There must also be a limit to the size of worms if hundreds were to feast upon a single fungus. But there was no limitation to the greediness of the adult creatures. There were blue bottles and green bottles and all the flies of metallic luster gathered at a Lucullan feast of corruption. The buzzing of those swarming above the golden pool was a tremendous sound. The flying bodies flashed and glittered as they flew back and forth, seeking a place to alight and join in the orgy. The glittering bodies clustered in already found places were motionless as if carved from metal. Burl watched them, and then he saw motion overhead. A slender, brilliant shape appeared, darting swiftly through the air, enlarging into a needle-like body, with transparent shining wings and two huge eyes. It circled and enlarged again, becoming a shimmering dragonfly, twenty feet and more in length. It poised itself abruptly above the pool, and then darted down, its jaws snapping viciously. They snapped again and again. Burl could not follow their slashings, and with each snap the glittering body of a fly vanished. A second dragonfly appeared, and a third. They swooped above the golden pool, snapping in midair, making their abrupt and angular turns creatures of incredible ferocity and beauty. In that mass of buzzing creatures, even the most voracious appetite must soon have been sated. But the slender creatures still darted about in frenzied destruction. And all this, while the loud, contented, deep bass humming went on as before. Their comrades were slaughtered by the hundreds, not forty feet above their heads. But still the glittering rows of red-eyed flies gorged themselves upon the fluid of the pond. The dragonflies feasted until they were unable to devour even a single one more of their chosen prey. 
but even then they continued to sweep madly above the pool, striking down the buzzing flies, though their bodies must perforce remain uneaten. Some of the dead flies, crushed to pulp by the angry dragonflies, dropped among their feasting brothers. Presently, one of them placed its disgusting probacus upon the mangled creature. It sipped daintily from the contents of the broken armor. Another joined it, and another. In a little while, a cluster of them pushed against each other for a chance to join them in a cannibalistic feast. Burl turned aside and went on, leaving the dragonflies still at their massacre, and the flies absorbed and ecstatic at their feast. The feast indeed was improved by the reign of murdered brethren from overhead. Only a few miles farther on, Burl came upon a familiar landmark. He knew it well, but had always kept at a safe distance from it. A mass of rock had heaved itself up from the almost level plain over which he traveled to form an outjutting cliff. At one point, the rock overhung, forming an inverted ledge, a roof over nothingness, which had been preempted by a hairy monster and made into a fairy-like dwelling. A white hemisphere clung to the rock, firmly anchored by long cables. Burl knew the place as one to be feared. A clotho spider had built itself a nest there, from which it emerged to hunt the unwary. Within the silken globe was a monstrosity, resting upon cushions of softest silk. The exterior had been beautiful once, but if one went too near one of the little inverted arches, seemingly closed by panels of silk, it would open, and out would rush a creature from a dream of hell. Surely Burl knew this place. Hung upon the walls of the fairy palace were trophies. They had a purpose, of course. Stone and boulders hung there, too, to hold the structure, firm against the storm winds that rarely blew. But amid the stones and fragments of insect armor, there was a very special decoration, the shrunken, desiccated skeleton of a man. The death of that man had saved Burl's life two years before. They had been together, seeking a new source of edible mushroom. The clotho spider was a hunter, not a spinner of webs. It had sprung suddenly from behind a great puffball as the two men froze in horror. Then it had come forward and deliberately chosen its victim. It did not choose Burl. Now he looked with half-frightened speculation at the lair of his ancient enemy. Some day, perhaps. But now he passed on. He went past the thicket in which the great moths hid by day, past the slimy pool in which something unknown but terrible lurked. He penetrated the little forest of mushrooms that glowed at night and the place where the truffle-hunting beetles chirped thunderously during the dark hours. And then he saw Saya. He caught a flash of pink skin vanishing behind a squat toadstool, and he ran forward, calling her name. She emerged and saw the figure with the horrible bulk of the spider on its back. She cried out in horror and Burl understood. He let his burden fall, running swiftly to her. They met. Saya waited timidly until she saw who this man was, and then she was astounded indeed. With golden plumes rising from his head, a velvet cloak about his shoulders, blue moth fur about his middle, and a spear in his hand, and a dead spider behind him, this was not the Burl she had known. He took her hands, babbling proudly. She stared at him and at his victim. But the language of men had diminished sadly, struggling to comprehend. Presently her eyes glowed. She pulled at his wrists. When they found the other tribesmen, they were carrying the dead spider between them. Saya looked more proud than Burl. End of Chapter 4